Hello. Today I'm here to talk about a film that I've mentioned before and I haven't really discussed much about. Um, and the film is 45 years old this year. And um, it is one of my favorite movies of all time. Earlier in this year I gave my top 20 uh, favorite movies and uh, it had been was always in the top 20s but I moved it up into the top 10s and uh, it's my 7th favorite movie of all time uh, uh, behind uh, <clears throat> uh, the Godfather trilogy which is in 6th and you know uh, there's so many others uh, in the first five uh, uh, spots. Um, and that is uh, Taxi Driver. Uh, this is the first uh, uh, version of the film I got. Uh, the uh, DVD that I uh, still have. It's like the 35th or the 30, 31st anniversary, 2007. Um, this was from the back of it, and I guess you could probably... on the back and have it there likely still okay I just don't really have that on the back though but you know it's kind of cool and famous uh, look of the of a uh, Travis Bickle Robert De Niro um, and then I have uh, two blu-rays so the first one I got, and here's that. Various images from the film. And one reason I haven't gotten rid of this one is due to uh, the uh, all of this stuff that comes with it. Images. So, yeah. It's a poster, a little version of the poster. And um, aside from Robert De Niro being the obvious star of the film, it also has a very young Jodie Foster. She was like 12 when she made the movie. I believe it probably like turned 13 or so later on. in the taxi taxi cab later in the movie where he has a his various guns and he's got a his 44 magnum Sybil Shepherd as Betsy Robert De Niro in Martin Scorsese. Robert De Niro and Harvey Keitel as Sport. Uh, Robert De Niro's uh, Mohawk. And interesting what they did was they uh, glued his hair down to his skull so they could fit the skull cap with the mohawk which was made of um, horse hair like horse mane um, because they of course shot it out of sequence so when they got to do all the stuff where he had the mohawk they glued his hair down to his skull to fit the uh, like the cap all cap, well not completely 
ball cap but to his head so that way they could have the mohawk and it would and they did that and they had to like glue it later on there's uh De Niro uh, with his uh well, a contraption with the gun that he created and a palatine uh, posters in the back you know, the senator he becomes sort of obsessed with because of Betsy you know he becomes you know, obsessed with her uh, him with the uh, 44 magnum Spickle. end of the climax of the film and then the overhead shot of the aftermath I guess a spoiler of some sort if you have never seen this film but yeah and uh Yeah, so that's uh, one reason I've never gotten rid of the this D, uh, Blu-ray because it has these cool uh, little like cards, I guess you could say, um, that no other version has. So there we go. And here is a one of the a famous scene um, with Scorsese at a cameo. He actually has two parts in the film, um, which I'm sure many know by now. Um, and there's him at the here the the uh, be alert. Yeah, the taxi place near the opening, like of the garage you know many people know that uh, um, many people know of Scorsese's cameo in the cab where he's talking to De Niro about his wife being in another apartment with a black man so he doesn't say black man he uses a specific word uh, 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 racial epithet racial slur and yeah and uh, he says how he's gonna sh kill his wife he's gonna shoot her with a 44 magnum shoot her in the face and he's like you ever seen what a 44 magnum could do in his face Travis should see that and then she'd also see what a 44 magnum could do to a woman's <laughs> you know and he should see that too and De Niro you know Travis is just going he's looking at him through the mirror he doesn't really ever turn his head and talk to him he just looks at him and just sort of like speaks and uh, the last blu-ray I have of this film is the 40th anniversary edition um, I did not get to see this film on the big screen for its 40th anniversary it had some family stuff I was doing um, but that's completely fine. Um, I hope one day they will have it on the big screen again, like the 50th anniversary, because it would be a real shame if they didn't do it. would be a true shame, I think, to, <clears throat> like, another huge anniversary, like a milestone comes by, and then they never again release it on the, re-release it on the big screen. Um, but yeah, this has a 40-minute, uh, Q&A. Uh, with Robert De Niro, Jodie Foster, Martin Scorsese, and many more. Uh, yeah, I love this film. You know, not much to really say that I, others haven't said, but, you know, the performances are excellent. Paul Schrader's script is incredible. Surprising he did not get an Academy Award nomination for original screenplay. I would have thought he would have been a shoo-in, but, you know, he had also... Rocky, the same year, Stallone, got two nominations that year for actor and screenplay for Rocky. 
De Niro got a Best Actor nomination, which he deserved. Um, and I think he should have won. I know, you know... Oh. Network. Yeah, yeah. I know uh, Peter Finch won. Yeah, Peter Finch for Network. He won for Network um, posthumously. Um, but I believe, you know, um, Robert De Niro gave a better performance. I actually think this is uh, Robert De Niro's uh, the best performance of his entire career. Um, obviously, he's had a long career, many great parts in films. Godfather Part Two, Raging Bull, Goodfellas. Uh, so many to list, but I think that, you know, just this character, Travis Bickle, is just such a fascinating character. He's such a, uh, an interesting guy. He's has PTSD. You know, he um, you know, is in the Marines in the Vietnam War, which, you know, throughout his the film, the behavior he has, you know, he even says to Wizard, played by Peter Boyle, that he has some bad thoughts in his head. Um, you know, he, you know, really, uh, it's, you know, incredibly likely that, you know, his experience in war has changed him. So whatever he might have been like prior to the war, he, he has changed. Um, throughout the film, he uh, writes in a diary, a journal. And um, in his writing of the journal, uh, is sort of like Arthur Bremner, who uh, shot uh, George Wallace. You know, and you can read in his diaries that came out later. But at the time, Paul Schrader wrote this script. Those diaries uh, had yet to even be released. Um, but when he read them, he was very surprised and shocked just how there were similarities between Taxi Driver and uh, Arthur Bremner. Because uh, uh, Bremner wanted to uh, shoot Ro uh, Richard Nixon. And when you, if you read the uh, diaries, you can tell how enthusiastic he, essentially he was. Like how once he came to that conclusion, uh, he was trying to go about succeeding in that. He sort of was very excited, but then he realized he couldn't really ever get close to Richard Nixon, especially after, like, there was, like, a speech he gave, and there was some booze, and... I believe, or maybe that was, uh, Wallace. Like, he had a hard time, yeah, like, Wallace, uh, wasn't gonna shake people's hands, because of the crowd, yeah. That was Wallace, not Nixon. But because of the security around Nixon, because, you know, he was the president... He realized he would never really be able to get a chance to shoot him. Like, up close, like, you know, sure, he could have shot from distance, but, you know, want to be closer. Of course, that's not a very good thing to do. Do not, you know, try to shoot politicians. I do not at all uh, recommend that. That would not be good, regardless if you like them or not. Or in this guy's case, he didn't really seem to care. He, he had in his mind that that was, like what he was supposed to do. Oddly enough, and in the film, it seems what Travis thinks. Um, and the name Palantine, um, the senator, who Betsy, you know, Sybil Shepard, uh, works for his campaign, and she, uh, he becomes infatuated with her. Um, but then as the film goes on, things do not go well. He takes her to her porno theater and she doesn't like that uh, unsurprisingly but he seems to go to porno theater quite a bit and um and they had a to show that they have to um you know uh do a lot of blurring so that the film can be rated r um, and also the final uh shootout scene at the end they desaturated the color they, uh, so that the color red wasn't as bright anymore, um, uh, and that was able to get the film an R rating, so it didn't have to be an X, uh, oddly enough, um, 
And something that, you know, Quentin Tarantino actually has said, you know, he loves this film also, but he said that he believes that, you know, the MPAA, now called the MPA, you know, they don't like the color red. So when uh, he and Robert Rodriguez did From Dust Till Dawn, they made the vampire blood green. That way, when the vampires were killed, you could have all the vampire blood you wanted and MPAA will not, you know, censor or make you cut a whole bunch of that stuff out because, you know, it's it's green, it's not red. Um which is quite interesting. Um and I think he does have some points there. Uh but you know, uh Scorsese uh, was upset at when, you know, the people of Colombia were like, you know, just just get this film in R. You know, we don't care what you do, but you need to get this in R because we can't just put it out there uh, uh, the way it is now because it'll just be an X. And uh, Scorsese later said he kind of regrets it because, you know, any and all the film stuff that they uh, could go and put back into the movie to have it the way it was always meant to be to where the color is not desaturated at the very end of the film uh, well not the entire end of the film but you know the big huge climax of how of the shootout you know if you've seen the movie you know what i'm talking about uh, uh and how you know there are no film reels of where the color is there like the original color and the original blood and everything you know that's not there anymore um just quite unfortunate like the film just deteriorated so much that you know even if you restored it the best you could it the the original color would just not be there um, um i mentioned uh uh, Jodie Foster, you know, throughout the film, you know, you know, she gets into Travis Bickle's car. Her name is Iris. She's a twelve-year-old prostitute, and uh, Sport comes to get her and uh, pays her, uh, gives him like a twenty-dollar bill that's like crumpled up. And then later on, you know, she asks him to get her out of there, and later, uh, he acts almost hits her but stops in time and then he later sees her again that he wants to you know make it with her but he doesn't want to he wants to help her and he later uh he has breakfast with her later on like at one o'clock that's when she gets up basically and they talk and they're like you know she should just be home and you know going on dates always in in school and all of this shouldn't be out you know prostituting or anything um like that that's not good for her so you know whatever you you can say a lot about travis bickle you know he has problems and back then in the 70s veterans vietnam veterans i guess in particular at, at that time there really wasn't a whole lot of help they could get and so unfortunately uh, people like travis bickle were fairly common. Those who saw Vietnam were in combat, saw a lot of terrible things, maybe even did a lot of terrible things just to get through the war, just so you could, you know, like you do your duty, do your job of whatever you're supposed to do. Um, which would a lot of like, you know, some cases like challenge your ethics, like, you know, you know, regardless of what you where you stand morally or ethically on something you might have to go against it to just survive so you can survive your other get the other like brothers in arms can survive and all that you know and all that would take a toll on you and uh, no doubt it takes a toll on Travis Bickle uh, um, but even with the bad thoughts he has and like you know anger and he even says throughout the film like you know one day a rain should come and one day a rain should come and wash all this 
off off the street, like you know, and you know, Paul Schrader has even said like you know how he's uh, like racist, which he is. And Bo early in the film when he first goes to like the porn theater, uh, he tries to hit on a woman uh, who works there. Uh, black woman and I think if anything it might be like you know might be for women he doesn't really care he wants a connection he wants a connection with women uh, with any woman really you know like sexual you know relation, just a relationship of some sort um, so in that case he doesn't really care about the color of women but for guys or men he seems to be very you know racist you see a lot of black guys throughout the film pimps and such yeah, he's on the street walking around and uh, there's a cabbie he meets uh, Charlie T and there's also Doughboy so wizard he Doughboy are white Charlie T is black eh you know and they seem to be fairly civil um, I think part of that is because you know they're both cabbies they have something in common uh, you know he's not overtly rude to Doughboy doesn't really give him a so, sort of like glance or look that he uh, might give other black guys in the film. But, you know, I think because they're both taxi drivers, you know, they uh, there's some sort of mutual or common ground that, you know, they can have. Be civil regardless if they become friends you know, they can be at least civil um, so while he's like racist to other you know other black people um, and again that could also uh, again, attribute to um, the experience of Vietnam you know not you know you know changes him quite a bit and um, he you know really it's like, you know, as Paul Schrader says, he's like, he's like a time bomb. He's just ticking away until he explodes. Um, and by the end of the film, he does explode. Granted, he doesn't get to assassinate the senator like he wanted. Um, but he does something else. Spoiler to everybody who hasn't seen this film. He kills Sport. And the uh, guy who like, sort of manages this, like... Uh, building of sorts to uh, of where you know guys go up and you know do their thing and pay and all that um, as well as this mafioso who's with Iris and then the whole end of that his goal is to then kill himself you know you know with Palantine you know it's like he was likely going to be killed by the Secret Service guys after he shoots Palantine um, also, um, Albert Brooks is in the film. Uh, he uh, he works with uh, Betsy. His character works with Betsy and uh, the campaign. And there's a scene where he goes like, you know, how you got a box of buttons with the wrong thing. Like, you know, it's like we are the people is like their tagline. And it says, and, you know, we are the people. There's a bit of a difference instead of we are the people. There doesn't seem to be a big difference there, I think. And how they will throw the buttons away because, you know, they messed up and they're not going to, I don't know, I would say just get a refund, but I don't know. Uh, maybe that wasn't going to be an option, fortunately, um, for them. But uh, anyway, you know, the, the explosion that Travis has, you know, how it's sort of like a reset by the end of the film, how, you know, he, he exploded and he's alive, at the end he doesn't die, he got shot in the neck, but not too uh, severe, he got shot in the arm, and then, uh, yeah, from the hospital and recovered, got a letter from, uh, Iris's parents, they've taken, they've gotten a, they got her back, and, uh, they're in, like, a, they're in 
Philadelphia. I believe Pennsylvania. State of Pennsylvania. Um, either Pittsburgh or Philadelphia. Right. Now, I'm blanking on exactly where uh, they live in there, but... Um, in the paper, newspaper clippings, you can actually see Scorsese's parents. It seems to be like that's Iris. They're Iris's parents, um, and apparently, uh, Scorsese's mother was a cab driver or a cabbie. He picks up patron uh, that uh, Travis picks up, but uh, that didn't really fit with the uh, film because he, you know, Travis gets sort of these seedy customers. And he says at the beginning he will drive anytime, anywhere. He doesn't care. Even bad places. And, you know, he puts himself in these bad neighborhoods and says, like, there's a lot of filth and that this, you know, the scum needs to be washed off the street, you know. And now, like, he says to Palatine because he gets in his cab at one point and now somebody needs, just needs to uh, flush this toilet down the, or flush all this gum down the toilet uh and how uh you know you know he's got a lot of hatred and he's putting himself in these situations and it's all his own fault really he, he'll go anywhere he doesn't care he'll work anytime likes to work late he has insomnia too and uh you know he makes contraptions later for like the like the gun and the uh, under his it was on his arm the sleeve his jacket sleeve and he uh of course you know he improvised the famous line that everybody knows from this film you talking to me you talking to me and you know uh, it's been parodied so off so much in other movies and shows de niro apparently the night before they uh he saw uh, Bruce Springsteen, and he apparently said that to the audience. Like, they wanted him to keep going, and he just repeated that, so he remembered it. And in the script for that scene, it says, Travis talks to self in the mirror. Like, he just talked to himself. There was no dialogue Paul Schrader thought of writing. I don't know if he thought, you know, maybe it'd be a good idea who, whoever plays this part, just say something. Or maybe he couldn't think of anything. Maybe it was a combination of both. Um, but because he didn't write that, you know, and De Niro said it, and his delivery is great. It's one of the most iconic lines in film history. Um, and this is one of the most iconic films of all time. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, this film was also nominated for Best Picture. Did not win. That went to Rocky. Again, uh, Peter Finch won Best Actor over De Niro. Um, Jodie Foster did not win Best uh, Supporting Actress. Uh, Beatrice Street uh, won Best Supporting Actress for Network. Um, so that was a big year for Network. Won, you know, all the acting categories. It was nominated for. Though so William Holden lost Best Actor to Finch. Uh, though I'm a bit surprised that, you know, in that category for network, they didn't cancel each other out. But it's one of those rare cases where you got two uh, actors are up against each other and both don't lose. You got, you know, uh, one was able to win, though for Finch it was posthumously. Um, he, uh... And again, P uh, Peter Finch did a great job, as did Willem Holden. But I still think that uh, De Niro uh, did a great job. He, he did the best job, in my opinion, of the nominees. I mean, the nominees also were, you know, uh, Giancarlo Giannini, French, apologies. To any French viewer for me screwing up that name, he was nominated for The Seven Beauties. And, of course, uh, Sylvester Stallone was nominated for Rocky. Um, but, yeah, I think Robert De Niro uh, 
uh, gave the better performance. Um, Martin Scorsese being snubbed by the Academy uh, for his direction here, I think that is also quite a shame. Um, you know, John Appleson uh, won for Rocky. You know, and Rocky is a very good film, an excellent film. I can understand why that film won over Taxi Driver. You know, Taxi Driver is a very dark film. And, and I guess in some of the other previous years, some dark films uh, were given like top prizes and such. Like, you could say, like, Godfather, Godfather 2. Those films won Best Picture and Acting Categories. And De Niro actually won Supporting Actor for Godfather 2. And Brando won Actor for Godfather 1. So perhaps, like, wins like that, you know, previously, that could have possibly skewed in some way uh, the Academy's decision to not, you know, give Best Picture to this film, or uh, De Niro and Oscar, Jodie Foster won, but, you know, you know the, or even nominate Scorsese. I think he deserved it. Um, but, you know, that's just me. Uh Bernard Herrmann uh, composed the score, and this was the final score he composed. Uh, there was another film that came out later in 76, which that would technically be the final film he composed uh, in terms of release date. But this is actually the very last film he composed, because he, composed, he finished the compos composition for Taxi Driver, just before he died, like, uh, he finished his work, he then, uh, went to where he was staying, went to bed, and died of a heart attack in his sleep, and so, technically, Tax Driver is the final film he ever worked on. Um, he didn't get an uh, Academy Award for this film, but he got nominated. Um, this film also... Won the prestigious Golden Palm at the Cannes Film Festival. Cannes Film Festival. Um, <clears throat> which I believe at that point was, I think that's what the Palm Door later became, if I'm not mistaken. It could be. But I remember that the Palm Door uh, came from something else. Let me, yeah, 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 that is the Palm Door. Yes, it is what is now the Palm Door, but back then it was the golden palm um and for some reason you know it's incredibly rare for a film to win uh like the palm door and then later it gets nominated for like best picture for it to win it's incredibly rare it doesn't happen too often it can happen but it doesn't seem to happen uh fairly regularly but you know um this is a film that won that award and didn't win uh so yeah, this is just me expressing my fondness and love of Taxi Driver. Uh, great film. Uh, one of the best that's ever been made. Uh, you know, the 40-minute uh, Taxi Driver Q&A is exclusive to this release. Uh, it has the original uh, 1986 director and writer commentary that was on the Criterion Collection because um, Criterion released that on Laserdisc and I think it would be awesome if like say like the 50th anniversary if they were able to get Taxi Driver and um, <clears throat> release it again because you know, that would be a great release especially you could do, they could do it on 4K and uh, Blu-ray you know uh, have that and that would be great I think um have it on 4K as well as uh, uh, Blu-ray again, and um, the uh, the making of Tax Drivers on the second disc, and it wasn't until I uh, popped the second disc in to rewatch that that I realized that that's a that's a DVD that the second disc is a DVD, um, and you know nothing wrong with that. DVDs are fine and all. But, you know, considering the fact that the making of Taxi Driver is on Blu-ray here, 
and not here. That was a bit interesting, I thought. Um, maybe they could have put the theatrical trailer and some of that stuff uh, from the first disc over there. Uh, though I don't know why they couldn't put everything on just one disc. Um, here's what the discs look like. But yeah, I don't know why they couldn't just uh, put... Uh, everything on this disc um, again blu-ray is supposed to be like the has the capacity of like five uh, DVDs if I recall correctly so since a lot of that was uh, put on minus the 40 minute uh, Q&A you know a lot of the special features were on the second disc of this DVD and then everything from here was on one Blu-ray disc. Um, but I don't know. I guess they because it's the 40th anniversary, you know, have two discs, you know. Might as well, you know, be, uh, I guess, uh, more bang for your buck. Um, but yeah, uh, great film, excellent movie. It's my favorite Scorsese film also. Um, I think this is the best film that both Robert De Niro and Martin Scorsese have done. You know, in their in their uh, careers, not just together, but just in general. Um, even though I rank the Godfather trilogy um, above this film, I have always said that the first film is my favorite. I like the second film a lot. I don't think it's better than the first. I've explained why before. So if you want to know my why I say that, you, know, you can watch uh, 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 those videos. Um, but yeah, um, one last thing I want to say. You know, I mentioned Palantine throughout this uh, video. Uh, it is that name. You know, Palantine is uh, what. Um, George Lucas initially uh, wanted uh, Emperor, the Emperor's name to be, but you know the fact that you know it's an obvious reference to Palantine from you know Taxi Driver. You know he and Scorsese are friends, and you know on one hand Scorsese probably wouldn't mind, and even I'm sure Paul Schrader might not mind. You know they might have been flattered that George Lucas would put you know that name into the, one of the Star Wars films. But then, you know, the whole legal uh, stuff would happen with, like, Columbia and all. So he just decided against that and just named it Palpatine um, instead of Palantine. So, in a way, you can thank uh, Taxi Driver for being the inspiration George Lucas had when giving the Emperor a name and not just calling him just the Emperor, you know. But, yeah, um, even though, you know, Palpatine has never actually said in Return of the Jedi, you know, he, uh, you know, later in the prequels that would be his name. But, yeah, I just thought that would be another thing that was interesting to throw in there uh, for all those who are still watching at the end. Um, again, I love Star Wars, so. That would also fit in. Plus, Lucas and Scorsese are very good friends. Um, so, yeah. That's my thoughts on Taxi Driver. I love it a lot. Great film. Uh, excellent movie. Um, what do you think about Taxi Driver? Do you enjoy it? Do you dislike it? Are you somewhat on the fence? Um... The AIFI uh, like listed him as one of the top Travis Bickle as one of the top uh, hundred like movie villains. I disagree. I would say he's an anti-hero because uh, he is the protagonist, and you know he does have dark th thoughts and he does do some stuff in the film. He also kills a guy who's robbing a, uh, a, a convenience store that he was at. Who uh, was black, so. Because you could also put that with the whole, you know, him being racist and all. But 
But, you know, he the guy was robbing uh, the, the store, so... But he did have, didn't have a permit um, when he got his guns, so there's also that. Um, but, yeah, uh, yeah, I just love this film. Uh, I could go on on lengths about why I love Taxi Driver. It's one of my favorite films of all time. Saw this when I was a teenager, and I... I've loved it ever since. It's a, a great movie, iconic movie, and it deserves the uh, recognition it has. Um, I know this is a bit long, and I didn't necessarily intend for it to be this long, but, you know, when you love a movie uh, like this, and I have a lot to say about it, obviously, uh, sometimes you, you can make exceptions. You just... Uh, litter rip basically um, and I did I love this movie um, so again do you, uh, do you enjoy it do you dislike it why why not you can comment uh, in the comments if you want and I hope you all have a great day have a great week have a great weekend and I'll see you all next time bye